Hey, we are in a series of messages called Win the Day, uh, taken out of Mark Batterson's book. We have a couple more uh, messages to go in this, and uh, then I think I'm going to swing back around and finish up uh, Nehemiah teaching us how to rebuild our world, because there's still a few things I'd like to uh, glean out of all of the wonderful ideas that are in that book. Today's message is called Wind the Clock, Wind the Clock. To win the day, you have to wind the clock. And uh, I, I, I want to talk about uh, time today. I want to talk about uh, not just time management, which is a good idea to get a hold of, but uh, what I really want to do is just kind of give some random musings on time and how we look at time. Uh, I just celebrated this past week my 65th birthday, and uh, I, I want to say thank you to everybody who you know, wrote a note or participated and pitched in on uh, a birthday offering just to show appreciation, so uh, so grateful for that. Um, this year, October, uh, I'm going to be celebrating 40 years of marriage with my amazing bride, um, and I know, I know <laughs> you're starting to think, so you're just going to keep uh, drilling in on how old you are. Um, but uh, I, I want to say I've, I've, I've been in full-time vocational ministry for over 40 years. So I don't know everything. Uh, I've discovered I, that I probably more I need to know than ever. Uh, but uh, but I, 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 have, I have lived long enough to be able to look back and have a few ideas. And uh, I think some of these ideas have proven to be fruitful and helpful in my life, and some of this is going to come to you guys as a bit of a reminder. Uh, some, of you, some of it is going to come as, oh, wow, I never looked at it that way before, but uh, I want to go 30,000 foot over the concept of time, of winding the clock. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 25 says, I have been young, and now I am older. Amen. Uh, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. And, and I just want to share some thoughts about how we think about, about time uh, in our life and hopefully help us all to have confidence. Uh, that God is taking our history, God is taking our present, God is in the future already, and uh, he's a good God, and he is watching out for us, and I want you to feel confident about that. So uh, concept number one that I want to talk about for a minute is this, time marches on for all of us. Um, and uh, I could just say from this vantage point, uh, it marches faster than you think it will. A lot faster than you think it will. It didn't seem that long ago that I was 40 years old. Uh, it's just like all of a sudden, here I am at this point in, in my life. And, and I think when we start thinking about, about the march of time, I know we always hear that we should be aware of what's happening today and smell the roses today, if you will, uh, and engage in today. But I just, I think the value of time, when you think you've got tons and tons of time, sometimes you don't hold time as valuable as it really is. You, you, can, you can get more money, but you can't get more time, right? In other words, if you waste 100 bucks, uh, which all of us have somewhere, somehow, uh, you could get 100 more back. But if you waste the day, you can't get the day back. You can't get it back. And so I just, I just want to remind us all that time is marching on and, and it goes fast. Your, your kids are only going to be a toddler for a little while. 
And I know it's hectic and I know it's crazy to try to keep up with those little squirts, but it, you, honestly, there is going to come a point where you look back and go, oh, I wish I could shrink them back. Of course, there is a point when they're in the middle of it that you go, I wish they could brush their own teeth, right? But, uh, but you know, t- time marches on for all of us. We all get 24 hours in a day. We all, we all get the same amount of months in a year, um, and, and time is, is marching on. You're going to find that friendships ebb and flow. And, uh, you know, I remember one time when uh, I was driving Elizabeth to school. She was in high school. I don't know, maybe a sophomore or something. And some girl had been mean, mean girl. And uh, girls can just be so mean. Come on. And, uh, and, you know, and we were talking about how do you handle that when people get mean that were your friend. And uh, I said, and, we were, and I was describing to her, you know, how to hold loosely to people. And, and, he, and, you know, I said, some people come, some people go, some people stay. She goes, how do you know? I said, you don't. You never know. You don't, you don't know. It surprised me how many people have stayed in our world. And it also surprises me how many people have walked out of our world. And I'm just saying time marches on. Friendships ebb and flow. That's going to happen to everybody no matter what, how how nice you are or or how not so nice you are. And then the seasons of life are going to keep changing. You know, uh, we can't always, some winters are harsh, some winters are mild. Uh, Some summers are hot, some summers are not so hot. The seasons of life keep changing, but the time marches on for all of us. And in the scramble to try to keep it all together, uh, to try to keep everything managed, you can miss the moments of life. Uh, you know, I remember as when my, one of my daughters was playing high school soccer, Suzette and I would just show up for every game, no matter what the weather was like, we would show up for every game because those were the moments that we had to be there every Monday night for the past, I don't know how long it's been, but I am showing up to watch my grandson play Little League Baseball and kick. Believe me, there's, 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 there's two things that could not be more boring for a sports enthusiast. High school girls soccer or kid pitch baseball. Uh, it is, uh, but you know what? You, in trying to, to keep it all together, you can miss the moments. And, and I'm, I'm encouraging you to create the moments. You, you don't have to worry about trying to create this big thing all the time, but uh, uh, you got to schedule your pleasure, schedule your moments, because life is going to schedule your pain. Second idea, second musing on time is this. Time has been, time is, time will be. Time has been, time is, time will be. Uh, a, a guy named David McCullough was giving a speech one time, and he was, he was pointing out the difference between a traditional clock face and a digital clock face. And, and he was making the point, which I think is a, is a, a profound idea, is that the, uh, uh, an old-fashioned clock face shows you that there was time before, there is time now, and there will be time after. And a digital clock face tells you what time it is right now only. And... Let me just say about time, you have to remember that things have come before you uh, and things will come again after you. You you only have this moment to to live in, but this moment is built on previous moments. And this moment creates the next moment, right? All of us, are standing on the shoulders of someone who is brave before us. Who is brave enough to obey God, who is brave enough to launch out, who is brave enough to 
start a family, who is brave, brave enough to start a business, who is brave enough. And we need to be brave for the people who are coming behind us. Amen. Because you can't think that what you do in this moment is not having an impact on somebody else. It, it is always having a reverberation uh, in, into the future. Our church, we realized this when we bought our land and, and, and let the owners know that we were building a church on this property. Our church, we discovered, was a place where the Methodists used to hold camp meetings in the late 1800s and had a, a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit of God on their camp meetings. And it occurred to me that our church was the answer to the prayers of a previous generation. Time came before us. We are here standing on the shoulders of somebody who prayed us in to existence. And we are praying prayers today that are creating things for the next generation. So you don't know what God wants to do in the next generation, but you know he wants to do something. And he's looking for someone who will recognize I'm standing on someone's shoulders and I want to make sure I am providing shoulders for somebody else to stand on. There's, there's people that I will come across a picture. You know how you get a, a, a memory come up on Facebook or somehow something will pop up in your scroll of pictures and all of a sudden I'll realize this is a person who used to be part of our church five years ago, but they're not now. I had no idea they would not be now, but they are not now. They're not here anymore. And then there's, there are people that I have never even met yet that are going to be part of our church five years from now. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because you can't get swallowed in this, the pain of this moment. You can't get swallowed. Time has been, time is, time will be. Someone may have just hurt you in the most terrible way possible. But I assure you, God has someone else to come into your world who will bring healing into your life. Something may have happened to you that you have thought, I don't know how I'm ever going to make it through this. But I, I'm just here to assure you, time marches on and God will be there for you. I thought this was a great quote from uh, John Piper. Uh, is newness is no virtue and oldness is no vice. Truth and beauty and goodness are not determined by when they exist. Nothing is inferior for being old and nothing is valuable for being modern. This has freed me from the tyranny of novelty and open for me the wisdom of the ages. I would also like to add to this that, uh, that just to flip this around and say oldness by itself is no virtue, <laughs> you're right, and newness is no vice, he's making the point that we got to be able to, to grab a hold of the ideas that there have been beautiful things that were before us and we are building on them and there will be beautiful things coming after us. I, I, I love new. I do. I love new songs. Uh, I, I, I love to get the newest iPhone. I, I, love, I, love, I love the smell of a new car. Uh, I love new. There's no question. But what I'm saying to us to recognize that time was, time is, time will be, is that I can also love the past for how it's brought me to today. <laughs> Idea number, number three is this. The arrow of time moves in one direction for us, 
But God is omnipresent. He's over all of time. All right. I, I would like for you to think with me for just a moment. I know, sorry, it's church. But I'm still going to ask you to think for a minute. I, I love C.S. Lewis's picture of how do we understand God is over all time. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like an adult standing and looking at a train, a toy train track. And the adult sees the past, the present, the future. And that's the way God is. God, God, is, is, God is not, we're confined to time. But God is not confined to time at all. God is, God always has been, God is, God always will be. That God is preparing good works in advance for you. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which is so inter interesting to me, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Wow, think about that, that idea for a moment. God had it in his heart that Suzette and I would be living in Asheville 2021, coming out of a pandemic, and I mean coming out, yeah, of it. But he had all that prepped when I was being born and had a situation in my intestines that literally the doctors gave me a 5% chance to live. My mama always told me it was those nuns who were praying for you. That's why you're alive today. I said, thank you, nuns. I had, I had to remember that when I was in Catholic school and those nuns would wrap my knuckles with the ruler. Oh, thanks, so glad I'm alive for this. But a mystery to hold on to is that God has prepared in advance what you're to walk in now. The Bible says that he is ordering our steps. The steps of a man or a woman are established by the Lord. And he delights. He's not reluctant with us. He delights in his way. And when he falls, he'll not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Come on. God is in the business of strategically positioning you and me to be in the right place at the right time. You, you might think I'm behind schedule. No, you're not. <laughs> if, I could, if I could impress anything that I would love to have written on your heart today is that there is a good God who is over all of time watching over you. Establishing your steps, ordering your steps, preparing beforehand. And my urge to you is whatever you do, don't get disconnected from your relationship with God. And in my early years, uh, I, I, I was, I really actually, I think, try, I tried too hard. Uh, I think I, I thought too much of this depended on my efforts, my work, my grind, you know, my striving. And I didn't think I was grinding and striving. I just was trying. I was trying to make a place for myself. I was trying to figure out how, how do you do this? How do you start a church? How do you pastor a church? How do you try to keep all these crazy people? That was before. Nobody's crazy in our church now. How do you keep all these crazy people happy? <laughs> that, I still haven't figured that one out yet. But I, I understood that for the longest time, I think I was carrying the canoe rather than putting it into the water and riding in the canoe, right? And, and I've learned over the years to recognize 
God has prepared something beforehand. So you, in many ways, you got to let the game come to you. God has apportioned to each one of us a measure of grace. And my encouragement to you today is to live in your grace lane. Don't compare yourself to somebody else's grace lane. Live in your grace lane. Each one of us has been given a grace lane. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Apostle Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. And his, some of you get that joke, some of you are not old enough. His grace toward me did not prove vain. I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. To say, to say I'm going to find my grace lane and live in it doesn't mean I'm going to find my grace couch and lay on it. Because there is a labor, there, there is an effort and energy that you expend within your grace lane. But if you can get a hold of this idea that the goodness in your life doesn't have to depend on you. God is over all of it, and he's preparing before you, and he's establishing your steps. He's taking even when you trip and stumble and fall. He won't let you fall, hurl headlong down. So you got to know, I got a lane that God's apportioned for me. And I don't have to worry about my value in life because God's made a place for me. There is nobody else like you. So stay open-minded, but stay in your lane. Know your lane. Stay in it. Stay persistent in it. John 3, verse 27, Jesus said this, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given him from heaven. And believe me, heaven has so much goodness stored up for you. Psalm 16, verse 5 says, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage, my past is beautiful to me. I, I'm saying this with the expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to make this alive in you, but let the grace of God give you the amazing life God has already planned for you. And let me add one more thought to this, as long as I'm just musing. Uh, Never let anybody but God define your life for you. you. You are the one who has to live with your choices. I remember when I first started in ministry, I would be concerned about if somebody thought I should be driving that kind of car or a new car. And after a while, I realized I was trying to please them buying that car and then they left the church and now I'm stuck with the car they wanted me to drive but I don't want to be driving that car so make sure you stay in the right space obedient to the Lord but you got a grace lane that's your lane find your own lane find your own voice all right Musing number four, not all time is of equal value. Not all time is of equal value. I've taught a lot through the years about the, kind, the Greek words chronos and kairos that are both translated time. Chronos time is just the management of time. Chronos time is minutes. Kairos time is moments. Chronos time is how you manage a schedule, but Kairos time is aha moments, breakthrough moments, God moving in your life moment. And what I want to say is that Kronos time well used creates greater opportunity for Kairos moments. Let me, let me say that to you again. Kronos minutes 
well-managed create greater opportunity for Kairos moments, right? You're, you're more likely to have an encounter with God at mega worship on Friday night than you are watching Netflix. Amen. You're more likely to have a Kairos moment in church than just hanging at the house. Uh, You're more likely to hear from God reading your Bible than surfing social media. Can, Can you hear what I'm saying? I'm not a proponent of 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 cramming something into every minute. Uh, I don't. I, I think that's just that could get you to. I think I like margin. I think margin is good. But I am a proponent of spending time with intentionality. That there that you have to decide for your own world. But there are some things that you just have to say. This is going to be in my life. This is going to be a part of my life. These are, these are things that wind the clock for me. And I, I'm not perfect, and I'm not trying to tell you how to run your time in your life, but all I know is that I've determined that just about every day of my life, there's got to be time that I have set aside to read God's Word and let it speak to my soul. And, and that's, a chron, that's a chronos moment that can create a kairos moment. I've pretty much determined and resolved that almost every day of my life, I'm going to have a prayer and worship session. I'm going to have a worship playlist. I'm going to walk around my house. I'm going to speak in tongues. It is Pentecost Sunday. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pray for the people that are in my world and the things that God puts in my heart. And I've, that, that's in my life. That's like, that's what's in there. I've, I've resolved that, that exercise has got to be in my life. I don't like exercise. I don't enjoy it at all, but I've got an eye on tomorrow, right? I've just, I've determined that every day I'm going to hug my wife. Amen. And all I'm saying is that not all time is of equal value, and you've got to make sure that some of your time is spent intentionally on the right things chronos moments that create kairos moments all right the last idea that i want to talk about is this number five live today with a vision for tomorrow here's a tension to manage that we are mindfully keeping an eye on the fact that all of us will live for eternity but I also want to keep my eye on the present opportunity. Eternity, opportunity. Learning how to stay in sync with what God is doing now, which I think is an interesting place in history that we find ourselves. In my lifetime, there's never been a global pandemic until last year. And here we are, emerging out of this, trying to figure out what does church look like now? What does business look like now? What, what, is, what, is, what is the world looking like now? And trying to stay in sync with what God's doing, but living with a positive expectancy for the future. You got... You, you got to live today knowing that tomorrow is coming. Suzette and, and my commitment to the health of our church has been a long-term commitment. Like, we've been here a pretty long time. 11,588 days ago, we drove into... Western North Carolina with a little U-Haul truck and everything we owned. And 
we look back and for 11,588 days, we've just said, we're here today. I don't want to do anything stupid today that messes up tomorrow. I'm going to say it for this side of the room. I don't want to do anything stupid today that messes up tomorrow. And, I, and I, we're not, they're nowhere near perfect. But for 11,588 days, we've been living in this place of saying, we got to be aware of what God is doing right now. But we also got to live today with a vision for tomorrow. We, we have a history. <laughs> We're living in the present, right? And we know there's a future. Our, our commitment to this church is as strong as it's ever been. And we are believing God for the greatest future ever for the life of our church. Uh, our commitment to our marriage has been and is a long-term commitment. When, you, when we said, I do, we also said, we're done. We're, so 14,464 days ago, Suzette and I said, I do, I will. And has every day been a happy day? For me, yes. <laughs> But all I know is, if I speak kindly today, it could make a better tomorrow. If I, if, I could, if I could just defer a little today, it will create a better tomorrow. And here's, what I, here's, here's where I, I want to kind of land on this. If you're going through something hard right now, there is a tomorrow. When, when you're going through hell, don't stop. You got to keep walking through your valley of despair. You got to learn those lessons that you learn only in the valley of despair. But I can assure you, you're going to come out brighter on the other side. Don't quit. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on your church. Don't quit on your marriage. Don't quit on that friendship. It, in 2006, I turned 50 years old. And we were going through the worst storm, the most difficult season that our church has ever experienced in all the years. And honestly, I've could not get a handle on how to, how to stop this thing from wrecking our church. And I, I honestly thought, this we're getting perilously close to unraveling here. I, I, I could not figure out what was going on. I did not know that we were reaching the end of the storm from hell I just knew we were in it, and I didn't know how, I didn't know how long it was going to last. But I remember these verses just spoke to my soul uh, so much. Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness are going to follow me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. I know sometimes people have, you know, they'll say something like, well, you know, I didn't like this that happened at church, so I'm leaving. And I'm thinking, there's a lot I didn't like. (laughs) 
none of you now, but my point in this is you got to remember that we've all had a past and we all have this and there is a future coming. And everybody somewhere, somehow is going to reach a hard time. But if you keep walking for 14,464 days, just go ahead and give her a hug. Come on. For 11,588 days, just get up again. Read your Bible one more time. Worship God one more time. Show up at church one more time. If you just keep walking through your back, don't quit. So don't make a decision in the middle of a storm that you're going to regret on a sunshiny day. You got to look back on God's faithfulness, but you also got to look ahead on God's faithfulness. Amen. I want to pray with you today. Would you bow your heads, please? Would you... Close your eyes. Father, what an amazing, mind-blowing idea that you stand over all of time and you've prepared good works beforehand that we would walk in. Somehow, in your grace, you cause it all to work together for our good. What an incredibly kind God you are. I'm praying for every person in this room who may be on the verge of quitting, who may be on the verge of giving up, that you will breathe fresh life and fresh hope and fresh faith into their soul. With your head bowed, your eyes closed, I just want to take a moment. Maybe you're here today, you've never actually surrendered to Jesus, I would love to pray with you. Or maybe there was a time that you could look back on where you know you were very surrendered to Jesus, but you're not there now. Stuff has happened, you've made decisions, people have done stuff, whatever's happened, taken place, and all of a sudden, you're not where you wanna be, where you could be, where you know you should be in your relationship with God. Come on, let's come back home. Maybe you just feel unsure about where you stand today. Nobody looking around. I just want to pray with you. But if you say, Pastor, I, I, know I need to surrender to Jesus or I need to come back to Jesus wholeheartedly or I just want to know for sure my life is in the hands of this God you've been talking about this morning. Would you pray with me? I want you to lift your hand real high all over this room and say yes to Jesus. Surrender to God. Give my life to the Lord. Come back to the Lord. Make sure I'm right. Just lift that hand real high. We're going to pray together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, anybody else? Just in a moment. I'm not asking you get your act together. I'm saying, would you surrender to this God and to his lordship in your life? Anybody else? Let's pray together. Let's say this prayer together. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I open my life. I open my heart to you, to your love to your Lordship. I need you. I want you in my world as my Lord. I know I've sinned. I've messed up. But I come to the cross where you've paid the price for my forgiveness. Thank you for a new beginning and a fresh start. Help me become the person you created me to be. Amen.